as soon as I'm supposed to introduce us, this is Stacy Alexander. Uh, she uh, works with us at the Center for Innovation Teaching and Learning and our uh, uh, in, um, learning the development, the learning design and development. I, I'm still working on that name. <laughs> anyway. Don't, we'll probably change again soon. Yes, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, indeed. Go, go ahead, Bonnie. You introduce yourself. And uh, Bonnie Simmons. I'm with CITL as well. I'm associate director there, responsible for operations. Kim Myers. I'm with CITL as well, and I'm the manager of teaching learning framework, whatever that means today. <laughs> As Sherry Myers, I'm not with the IT. <laughs> 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 I feel like an outlier. Yeah. Um, I'm uh, with the Faculty of Engineering. I work with Cooperative Education. Oh, okay. Oh, excellent. Go ahead. And, and I'm Natalie Goss, and I'm not with CITL either. So I'm with the uh, nursing faculty. Oh, and uh, as Kelly Albright said, I was actually, his introduction to this session caught my attention because I actually took two groups of nursing students for two separate and it was by far one of the most mm -hmm. transformational learning experiences for myself, but also for the students. I bet. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. They still talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. They still that. So I'm quite interested. What was it about their trip that you felt that was so transformative? They got to learn a lot about themselves. Okay. So they got to apply a lot of their nursing principles, uh, but in a different way. So even the way that we different than what they could actually practice. So they actually had to learn to do things outside of the box. So they don't have bandages down there. They didn't even have you know, bed rails there. So how do you do seizure precautions? So they moved the beds up against the wall when they got off. So they had to learn critically think. And so that taught them a lot about themselves, how they can handle adversity. And I think one of the biggest things was actually seeing people suffer do something yeah that's right that doesn't happen down there. they didn't even have morphine to give right they gave Tylenol to an accident victim so it was that whole experience that every day they debriefed them ethically how am I going to practice what am I going to take back with me and when they came back they had a whole new perspective perception of our healthcare system and their approach to people and their humanitarian efforts were it was just amazing they wow. grew in that time from the time I took them I wonder how much like the emotional intensity of that experience has to do with the amount of learning that occurs. Yeah, definitely right? really affected the depth of it. Yeah. But also with their cognitive domain and just their whole advocacy skills just blossomed because they didn't stop until they found something to treat the pain. So they learned so much just by being in a different environment where they had to still apply their knowledge and principles, but in a different way. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, it's interesting because one of the things that we're talking about with effective teaching is that you put your students into a situation, a learning environment, where they are willing to take risks, right? And uh, from that risk taking, they learn a lot about themselves. So, that, I mean, that's a really good example. Everybody was vulnerable there. Right? Yes. Yeah, interesting. Absolutely, and, and they're putting themselves at least in emotionally harm's way. You know, right? And it's, it's you know, there's 
there's a lot of lot, there's a lot of learning that comes out of that, that situation. Well, just like I say, we'll do the convention solution. Well, we'll keep the conversation going as long as you like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So uh, here's the session plan for today. We'll talk about uh, brief, de brief definition of trans. Oh, we, uh, well, we did introduce ourselves. Did we introduce? No, we didn't. We didn't. Well, I'm Trudy Johnson <laughs> and S. Albert Johnson. <laughs> uh, we've been, uh, yeah, we've been on the road for this uh, a while. On the road. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when, we, when we go on, you know, usually at a conference, I'll start by saying, "Well, you're going to see Trudy and I a lot uh, uh, during the conference because he's together a lot." It's okay, we're, we're married, and I tell you that because we want you to think we're having a conference fling. Those, <laughs> <laughs> those terrible things for your credibility. You know? <laughs> but, uh, so uh, anyway, so we're uh, we could take a look. We could try to define uh, transform, and there's a lot of definitions out there. We got one of the ones that, that's in that's in that, that that's in the literature. But you know, I think we're going to find from our examples about what transformation, of, what transformative learning means. We're going to talk a little links to. Uh, we're going to we're going to link, link it to effective teaching. Talk a little bit about te teacher presence and, and and what that means. And there's a little activity that we're going to do. Uh, so transformative learning. Just give you a minute to <coughs> read that. I think your second sentence of the shift of consciousness um, refers to certainly to what you were just describing, right? This shift of consciousness, yeah. Uh, and, you know, and definitely our relationship with other, other humans. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, it's, uh, it, it's very, very much, um, uh, very, 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 very much an interesting process. And it's not, not a bad uh, de 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 definition. Um, as early as 1978, and I, I was I was still in the university, and I was uh, experienced one of my first definitions of transformative learning, and it was in a and it was a program of a law school. It was called it was called Paper Chase, and uh, Professor Charles Kingsfield was the uh, a, a rough around the edges uh, old 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 law professor who taught con contract law. But I was interested. When I saw this, and as I was thinking about, about this, and I, I, I remembered that how he had tied what he was doing in terms of, of teaching and what he wanted to do with his students to a teaching method. I'm going to show you about, I think it's two minutes or so, of, 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 of a clip that, that he, you know, and, let, and I'll let him tell you that. The study of law is something new and unfamiliar to most of you unlike any other studies that you have ever gone through before. Here we use the Socratic method. I call on you, I ask you a question, and you answer it. Why don't I just give you a lecture? Because through my questions, you learn to teach yourselves. By this method of questioning, answering, questioning, answering, we seek to develop in you the ability to analyze that vast complex of facts that constitute the relationships of members within any given society. Now, you may think at times that you have reached a correct and final answer. I assure you, this is a delusion on your part. You will never, in my classroom, reach the final correct and ultimate answer. In my classroom, there is always another question. There is always a question to follow your answer. You're on a treadmill here. My little questions spin the tumblers of your brain. You are on an operating table. My little questions are fingers probing your mind. We do brain surgery here. You teach yourselves the law and I train your minds. You come in here with a skull full of mush, send you out thinking like a lawyer. Now you recite the case of... <laughs> and that's a pretty clear statement of transformation learning. Skull full of mush, thinking like a lawyer. <laughs> 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 that's, pretty, that's pretty much, you know, 
that's that's short and that's short and distinct. But what I like about this and, and, and about the approach is uh, how it was tied to the Socratic method. Socratic method in this particular case and for this, in, in this particular setting of law school, critical thinking is incredibly important. So how do you do that? By putting the right questions in front of your students. How do you do that? He's also the master of the mixed metaphor, <laughs> apparently. So, uh, but because uh, he used a lot of them there. In, in that speech, but in honor of Professor Kingfield, we're going to use the Socratic. Actually, I can't roll my R's like the great British actors. Do. <laughs> I tried that, and I hurt myself. Certainly, please don't try that home. <laughs> <laughs> it was. Um, uh, we're going to use this. We're going to use the so Socratic method. Um, uh, John, John, uh, John, John Houseman was the uh, was, was the actor. Uh, passed away in uh, uh, at 84 in 1988. Uh, but they say he was from that era of the great, of the great British actors. He's done Shakespeare, I guarantee it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so, uh, so anyway, so let's. Uh, so we're going to start with our first question, uh, and we're going to, and we're going to put you in groups. But that seems superfluous right now. <laughs> <laughs> we have a nice group of five. Yeah. <laughs> group five actually is a perfect number. What are the characteristics of your teaching that make it effective given your teaching context? Mm. Yeah, think so we're just looking at. Um, what are some things that you've done yourself or perhaps you've been in a situation, a learning situation as a student, either or, uh, where you thought that is the mark of an effective teacher? Like what did they do <coughs> or what did you do or say that would say that was effective? Can you think of any? Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> uh, I was just thinking Fine. that I think um, in situations where you're kind of forced to ponder and see something in a different way. Okay. So it, it's, it's altering the way you think of it. So I, I, I teach part-time and I teach math-based business. So, you know, when I'm, when I'm trying to teach or when I'm hearing somebody else explain it so that it forces me or forces the student to suddenly, it's like, oh, wait a minute, I never thought of it like that before. Yes. I, so I'm seeing it differently. Yes. Um, and I, I find that that then forces you to then see everything else around it a little bit differently, and then that helps with understanding. Yeah. Okay. My example is somewhat similar, although I, I, would, I will start by saying my context is a little bit different because I don't teach traditional courses mm -hmm. in cooperative education. We teach one professional development course. Okay. So really, our work with the students occurs a lot one-on-one -on -one when we meet them in the workplace. So our students can be working anywhere uh, in uh, as adverse situations, perhaps, as your students. But we've had students working in Africa, for example. We have students working in downtown St. John's, all over the world, really. Um, I can remember times meeting with students one-on-one. -on -one. They might be very worried about a mistake that they've made at work because I will then meet with the supervisor and you know discuss any issues um, but you know to me be them being on the job is a learning experience and so I focus on well, what you take away from this mistake take away the, yes. the great fear and concern that a mistake has been made yes. and turn it into well this is this is why you're here this is a learning opportunity um, yeah. for you right and then and talk through what the learning is from Right. And I think because they they're feeling so much that a mistake has happened, you know, there's like a lot of emotions around that, and there's people involved, and there's concern, mm -hmm. um, and then turning it into a bit more of a positive, it has like a lasting impact on them. Yes. And yeah. you walk away from okay, well, this was a mistake. I do realize this, but through reflection, like through conversations with other people, and through internal reflection, I think that changes thinking sure and then oftentimes students won't repeat that type of mistake again. right yeah and they know moving forward that they can look at mistakes from a more positive perspective as well That's one example and there's a whole body of literature out there uh, on the notion of learning through error as you probably know that you know and and that's one of the things that they're trying to put into the public school system now k-12 to is to teach students to move away from the notion of is this right, is this right, is it right, and oh, I made a mistake, I feel really bad, to oh, this is a mistake, 
why is it a mistake? What did you learn yeah. from that mistake? It's a very different it's way of looking at things. Take the stigma away from that. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. yeah. With the rise of standardized testing in that level, and even in the level as it comes in through in, in through university, and then Americans are, are leading the way on this for sure with that, with SATs and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's because of what's what's um, what the stakes are is is what causes the emotions and severity of mistakes. Right? Mm -hmm. The more we lead to standardized testing, the more we you know, and as opposed to you know that great you know they they, they say the shortest. The shortest project def 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 definition of all time. We will put a man on the moon and return him safely by the end of the decade, right? And right, so this is what this is what we do. This this, this is what we want to do. This will get. This is what. This is how we know we're going to be successful. We return him safely. And here's 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 the time. Right. We will unlimited budget. <laughs> right. So yeah. money, time. Right. So and uh, and it's uh, and and so you know you go in there. So if you make mistakes, that's a step. That that's seen as a step to succeeding. Whereas when you know whether whether, whether you're getting into this institution or or, or, or somebody else is, the stakes the, the stakes stakes are different. Right. So again, I think there's something some some something involved. Right. Maybe you want to add to. No, I agree. Sherry. I, I did have a name. <laughs> no name. You're like Dominion. You're, you're no name brand. I like it that way. That's right. And not anonymity. Anonymity. Yeah. Mm. Well, I mean, if, if, since we're a small group and, and we truly aren't going to, we're going to do this, but we'll, 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 we'll share a little bit as well. Because I want to talk about kind of different perspectives. We, we teach uh, students getting ready to teach in the intermediate sec 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 secondary school, and so when, when we get in a course called effective teaching, trickery teaches us teach, teach us social, social studies methods as well. Um, they got 17 years of being over here, being out right there, right? and I say, right, here you are, and here's where you're going to be. So what we got to do is this, right? You know, so we got to change your perspective totally. And they and a, and after 17 years, they've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. You've, hopefully they've seen a lot of good, you know, and very little of the bad, likely. Uh, but uh, but they can they, they can quickly go to examples when 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 we ask them and we and we rely a lot on uh, their experience. And that's one of the interesting things about teaching teachers. They already had a lot of experience with teaching, and uh, so but what they haven't done is reflected on it a lot. So it really gets interesting when they think about, gee, what did that happen? And that's interesting. Yeah, how did that happen? That could have been better if. You know, and so having them back reflect on experiences, and what really helps us uh, more than anything else, and and Ken uh, Ken Ken uh, Sir, Sir Ken Robinson in his TED talk on talks this, how a person uh, uh, how ed education runs deeply with people because there's a significant uh, emotional process going on. So you remember. We remember when something rough happened in the classroom, or something positive happened in the classroom, and so uh, and giving them an opportunity—that's that's our that's an, and it's an incredible advantage, because we have that that they, they have that data set, if you like, that we that we that we can work with them. So we use a lot of case case studies. We, use, we we taught high school for 12, 12 years before before we came to university. So we use a lot of case studies from from, from our own experience, which is really fun. They say, so what's the right answer? They say, well, there's not necessarily the right answer, but there is, you know. But there's an answer, and you're going to tell us why that was a good one or not so good. Yes, that. Yes. I just want to make a comment because I agree with everything you're saying, and I like to ask a lot of questions to kind of like what the, that guy that was his name. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> King, King, King's, King's Kingsfield. Kingsfield. Yeah, the doc, 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 Socratic Kingsfield. method or whatever. So in my class, like I do throw out questions, and then I'll get. Yeah. Mm. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, on the phone, or you know, yeah. they kind of avoid. Mm -hmm. with any discipline, but with nursing. So when we get to our clinic or a hospital, like I'll take something from the classroom, get them to apply it. And oftentimes with students nowadays, I'm seeing this trend where they're saying, don't ask me questions, you're making me intimidated, and mm -hmm. I'm the least intimidating person. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I don't like it when you ask questions, you're putting me on the spot. So do you guys find any of that now? Like, or I, I find it in my classes uh, with undergraduates. Yeah. Yes. Like I, I, yeah, because I teach undergrads. Yeah. So I do find that sometimes they don't like that approach. Right. And similar to what we've learned earlier today, like I think one of the, the key 
keynote speaker said, like those who want to avoid you sit in the middle. Mm -hmm. I find the exact same thing. Yeah. And when I do like point out, say, Sherry, what do you think of this or whatever, they get upset with me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They don't like that approach. Yeah. So I think it, that is a little bit of a transformational tool. I know you have to, you know, tailor your teaching to the individual. Um, but I don't know if that method of teaching will work for for everybody. There are a number of um, strategies that are suggested uh, to help that. Uh, you know, um, one of the things that we do in our uh, education courses, for instance, you have students who you know, no matter what, they're not going to ask a question or they're not going to answer a question. So um, oftentimes uh, what I'll do is I'm I put my questions together in advance and I post the questions and say, tomorrow in class, we're going to look at the answers to these questions. So come to class with one idea, just one. Um, the big fear with students that you just described is hearing their voice of the, in the sound of their voice, like I'm hearing now, in the room. All of us here don't mind that, but for those students, that's absolutely terrifying. And so they don't want to hear their voices. So what you have to do, and I, I teach a communications course, so what I get them to do is start very small with a one or two word answer. And they realize then, I made that sentence or that phrase I didn't faint, I didn't, you know, the world didn't come to an end, the roof didn't fall in on me, or, and nobody laughed, <laughs> right? Or went, you know, that was a stupid thing to say or anything like that. So, okay, I did it once, maybe I'll do it again. And so they very, very gradually get to the point where they're more comfortable saying things. But if they know the question in advance, or sometimes what I'll do is, if it's a big question that we're going to be investigating, I'll put the question up at the beginning of class and say, this is what we're going to answer. We've got 75 minutes to answer this question. So start thinking about what you would contribute to that answer. If it's a big enough room, which it usually is with undergrads, I'll put them in a small group first because you're much more comfortable speaking to a small group than you would in a class of 50. So in a, in a group of three, tell your other two people one thing that you think would answer that question, or two things, and write them down. And then choose somebody in the group who's going to report back to the class and take turns. So it's getting the sound of the voice where they didn't faint, <laughs> right? Uh, that's the obstacle, that's the big obstacle for them to do. Once they've gotten over that, then they feel more inclined to, you know, put their hand up or speak out or, or whatever. And, and I had a student one year who, uh, she's now, she's been a teacher now for 20 plus years. And when she started, she was like that. And she came to me the very first day of classes and she said, I can't possibly speak out in class. like." It's just not going to happen. I'll turn crimson red. And I said, her name was Sherry. And I said, Sherry, not to worry. I tell you what I want you to do. Tomorrow in class, I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to answer it. And she just went pale. And she said, OK, what's the question? I said, where are you from? <laughs> and she just said, St. John's. I said, that's what I'm going to ask you. Okay. I said, you think you're going to get that out? Yeah. I said, okay, let's try it. So the next day I did it. And then the next day I said, uh, Sherry, before she left class, I said, next day I'm going to ask you, what was the most important thing that you had learned from school? Okay. And she tried that. And by the end of the semester, but it was 13 weeks, but by the end of the semester, she was, you know, so it takes an example of like actively practicing skills. Mm -hmm. right? It is, yeah. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's, um, it, when you think about where they're going, but they do have that fear. They're chosen, you know, they're yeah. chosen an interesting profession because you've got to get over that. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, you've got to get over it, you know, and, uh, whatever you're doing. <laughs> right? 
Yeah. I mean, if you go into a doctor's office and you've got a problem, you've got to be able to speak up and say, this is what I've got wrong with me or whatever. Anyway, go ahead, Al. So this is what the research, you want me to? You you go ahead. Okay. Uh, This is what the research tells us about what effective teaching is. And um, they're not necessarily in any order, but you'll notice there is a theme. And the theme is it certainly has a lot to do with dispositions and personalities and uh, a sense of, of having a repertoire, as they call it, of teaching practices. What I usually refer to my students, I, I use the analogy of a, of a, a bag of uh, you know, golf clubs. I say, when you go into a classroom, you choose which one, which teaching strategy for that day, for that students, for that topic. So you need a repertoire of teaching skills and, of course, uh, we come back to the last one, which we're going to talk about in a minute, which is teacher efficacy. So that's what the research is saying. This is what students are saying. We did a survey of university students and asked them, what do they see as the qualities of an effective instructor or teacher? And this is what they came back with. Um, and you might see, well, yeah, that makes sense. But you might notice the last one is interesting, that they do appreciate humor. And, you know, if you're in a classroom for 75 minutes or two hours, you wouldn't mind a few, you know, good knock-knock jokes or something. (laughs) Um, But something to perk you up. Um, But other things, again, um, you know, I guess are are obvious, perhaps, to all of us. But are they practiced is the question. You know, are they practiced? And... In terms of the learning environment, we're told that an effective teacher maintains an academic environment where there are standards, where success is expected, uh, but not success in the sense of going into a class and saying, you know, look around you, one person sitting next to you is going to fail. That's not expecting success. It's everybody's going to be fine. And the last one is the one I like, which is taking risks. Um, As I mentioned that earlier, you know, the, the fear, getting over that fear and wanting to ask a question. And the relationship between teacher and learner is a very important part of effective learning. Uh, effective instructors encourage opinions, promote open expression, do not belittle the students, they know their content area, they don't pretend to know it all, there's nothing wrong with saying, gee, I really don't know, uh, earn, earns respect of their uh, instructor, and the students, and they have a sense of loyalty towards their instructor. And one that, um, there's a couple more here, develops an empathetic understanding, creates a classroom environment where there's positive interactions, and encourages, I love this expression, a thinker-friendly classroom. That's a constructivist term, and I really, I, I always write it up on the board in my classroom because that's the kind of classroom you want where students are not afraid to think, as you mentioned earlier, to think of something different, right? Like you were saying, just to go outside and think of, there's a different way of looking at this. Um, One thing that's not there that I've sort of transformed me as an instructor in the past couple of years has been my recognition of my students saying, I really want to my instructor to understand that I'm not like anyone else in the room, that we are all individuals. And that's been a really big part of my teaching in the last couple of years is that realization that everybody is different. And I went into a a communications class in January and one of the first things I said to them was, I'm not comparing you to each other. You're on your own bar. Everybody has a separate file on my computer I keep notes on your progress, you keep notes on your progress, so it's very metacognitive. And at the end of the semester, you and I decide how far you've progressed. But I don't compare you to you, right? Because that's an unfair comparison. You're all coming from different experiences and different academic backgrounds, so it's not fair. And different so, cultures. And different cultures and so on. So there's all of that into the mix. So I say, you compete only with yourself and we put you onto that bar. Um, So the other side of this, or the other part of this, is student engagement. And um, the question we are going to ask is, how do you know when your students are actively engaged in learning? 
Does anybody think of a situation where you were in a learning environment where it seemed like, well, I guess the one you described, uh, where students were really not thinking about other things, they weren't on their phones, they weren't on their laptops, but they were really thinking about what was happening. That's engagement. It would depend on the topic. Yes. For Absolutely. Instance, I have an unrelated topic. For, uh, I'm teaching someone how to uh, execute a, a, move, a movement in like boxing or something. Like yes. That. You can tell if this person is watching and paying attention when they're able to do something similar to what you did. Yes. Um, I, don't, I don't know about do, teaching words and stuff. No, that's, no, but that, that is, it's focus, right? What my mother used to say, your, t your mind is not on it, <laughs> right? You know, when you do something and you're, well, you, well, your mind is obviously, not, and I use that expression a lot every evening when I'm watching baseball and the Blue Jays can't hit a beach ball, and I'm saying their mind is not on it. They're up at the plate and their mind's not on it, but that's an example of, right, your mind being on it. Uh, so, me, me, metacog just a quick word about metacognition because Trudy mentioned that metacognition um, is we've 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 come to the conclusion after years of look, looking at teaching metacognition is the key to teaching knowing what you know and teaching creates it and teaching gets better be, be because of it and I remember my first experiences. Uh, teaching is, you know, you really, you know, and I, I got a major in English and a minor, minor in math, and so I go teaching math, and I say, geez, I, you know, I really get that now. I, and until you're trying to push somebody else, until you hear yourself say it, until you work through that, until, until, until you work through, through, through that particular process. For engineers, I would think it would be doing what's been presented to them in class and going on their work semester mm -hmm. and say, okay, I got to yeah. do this. That's when they have those moments where they take a lot of the theory that's covered in the class and then you have your, your scripted questions with your prescribed answers, but then you go into the real world and it's a little dirtier than that, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah, a little fuzzy. Yeah, they come mm. up against things they've never seen before. They have to take that theoretical knowledge and apply it to this yeah. you know, very specific industrial problem. Mm -hmm. And that's when they really, through working through it, and getting feedback from their supervisors and others while they're working through it and asking questions. Like that's when I see, that's when I think students are engaged is when they're asking, asking questions. questions. Yeah. Even if the questions are wrong. Sure. Like, <laughs> yeah. 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 But they're good you know, questions. Even if, you yeah. know, you could fine tune that question and you could get a better answer by yes. start asking. And at the end of the day, do you find that they have you know, it's such a eureka experience. I've done this and wow, because, you know, yeah, I can, I can take a textbook and I can learn all the stuff and I can regurgitate it on a test. But as you say, here I am out in the real world with a real problem. And they can say, now I'm doing engineering work. And they're yeah. often quite proud of themselves. <laughs> sure. So that, that sense of pride, I think, would provide more motivation. Absolutely. That's why I like the cycles of like the academic piece and the, the work piece, because mm -hmm. then they're motivated to go back to school mm -hmm. to learn more that they can apply it to the workplace. Yeah. Right? So there is a lot of pride. It's a real eye-opener. Yeah. 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 Our, and, and what they've learned is tangible. Yes. You know, because they can actually, they can identify it and write it out, and I now know X, Y, and Z. Yes. Right? And for us, it literally goes on the resume. Right. You know, yes, that's, that's right. right. That's, 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 they have a record of it. That's right. Yeah, certainly one of the interesting. Uh, we work with we work we work with everybody. We work with everybody in, in, in the university and, and have a teaching and, and the various groups that come into the teaching skills enhancement program or come, come come to our sessions. We find that there's a real longing for them to give their students everything they possibly can. You know, and you know, quite frankly, you know, I mean, there's there's a lot of desire of that in all the groups, but the nurses lead the way. You know, they really they want to, and I said. God bless them for it. It's great. They want to give their students the benefit of their experience. They'd give them their experience if they could. And it's one of, and it's one of those, those, those ironies. And experience, through experience comes that metacognition. Right? And, and that's what they want their students to have. You know, but the cruel irony is that's the one thing you can't give them. Right? They've got to go get it. Yeah, right? you know? yeah. And you can set them up. And, and uh, for, for, the, for the education students, and this, is, and this has gone on like for 15 years. Trudy students will go out on their apprenticeships 
or, or their internships out in the schools, and they'll email her back and say, I had a Trudy moment today. <laughs> and a Trudy moment is, she told us about that in, in the classroom, and we didn't have a context, or you know, we might not have believed it. But it happened today, exactly the way you said it was going to happen. <laughs> so, but it usually has to do with the grade eights. <laughs> usually, if, you know, if you're familiar with grade eight, that level, you know, 14-year-old adolescence, yeah. Usually has, yeah, it's exactly what they sound like, yeah. <laughs> And it's kind of, I get it, we, you know, and we kind of got it when you told us, but now that we're living it, we get it, you know. And that's, and there's a lot of stuff like that, 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 that it's, you know, they have that Eureka experience, and that's one of the joys of teaching, you know, like you have students come back and say, you were right. That's my favorite. Not that they come back and say you were right, but they'll say, well, I was in this situation today, and I knew exactly what to do because of, you know, this class that we did on yes. this, and I remember you doing this or whatever. Yes. Very, this, you know, on display. Yeah. And she's, she called me, and she said, I'll never forget you doing that in class. And when I saw the situation, I knew exactly what I had to do. That's right. <laughs> Those are some of my favorite stories. They are, aren't Golden. they? Golden. Yes, <laughs> yeah. And she'll never forget that. No, no. I had one of those happen this morning. I had a student who said, Hi, I'm, I'm writing you from London. I'm over here for a job interview. And I was in the interview this morning, and the first question was this. And as soon as they asked me, I thought, I remember. She, we, we were talking about that. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, it's, it's great. It, it tells you that they are engaged. It is. They're, they're there. there. Yeah. Anyway, I guess this is the last question, isn't it, Albert? Uh, yeah, this is, yeah, this is one about teacher, this is one about teacher efficacy. Teacher and, efficacy. And, and we haven't got a lot of time, so, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, All yours. I'll click through this one, but, um, but, but it plays a ma major role and it comes into, in, 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 in the metacognition. Teacher efficacy is your belief about how much your behavior Im impacts your student learning. So if you have a high level of teacher efficacy, that means that you believe that if I, if I hit the right teaching strategy or I keep going at it, they're going to learn it. Um, the research shows that high level of teacher efficacy is more significant in student achievement than all the other factors combined, which blows my mind because it sounds like self-fulfilling prophecy. Right? But when you think about it, when you think about the, the, whole, whole, the whole notion, my behavior affects my students' learning, so I'm going to, be, I'm going to behave in different ways until, 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 until they learn. It just means you keep going, you keep reflecting, you keep working at it, you keep, and that's the reflection uh, is, um, is, is the key. When we're doing teaching skills enhancement program, we talked to, uh, talk to him about that, I said there's two things that you take away from this program about your teaching. First one is that it should be purposeful. When you go into the classroom or you're planning a program or you're planning a course, you should know exactly what you want the students to know. Come, come, and 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 come, Coming here with a skull full of mush, you leave thinking like a lawyer, right? Very purposeful. Uh, the second thing is, is that your teaching is re is re is reflective. And after you're done and while you're doing it, you look at it and say, well, "What's going on here? How are they doing? How, how did that go? Well, how did that class go? That that worked. I think it worked, and my students think it worked. So we'll keep that in, but I'm going to change this part. So re reflecting constantly about it, and I, I tell them as well, you can have a great one the first moment you step into the classroom. And you're going to have a stinker in your 42nd year, <laughs> right? It's a, in fact, I had one last semester. It was still, <laughs> but, it was, but it's it's that that kind of that, that kind of process. So there's a quick quick look at uh, quick quick look at teacher te 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 teacher efficacy. It's teacher judgment, his or abilities, remote desired uh, out, uh, desired outcomes, or student engagement and learning. There's internal and external lo lo locus locus of control. There's been a lot of uh, our, one of our uh, research uh, co colleagues on this project where we're working on this is a counseling, psych 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 is counseling psych psychologist. So you know, uh, there were two teachers, a cognitive scientist, and a counseling psych psych psychologist. Seems like that should be followed up with walk into a bar. It should. <laughs> <laughs> it should, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, and, uh, and Carrie, Carrie, Carrie Bowman was, 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 was our counseling psychologist. And, we were talking about what we're doing and, and, and how we were teaching, you know, and, and we said it's a closer match almost to therapy than it is to, uh, because teachers, instructors put a lot of themselves emotionally into what they do. 
uh, it, they have a great sense of self-efficacy and a good re 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 repertoire of, of teaching skills and, 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 and learning to fall, fall, fall back on, uh, there's some padding for maybe some of the negative stuff that, that, might, that, might, that might, might come back. Uh, there's three domains of it. There's the task domain, and that's actually the, the technical teaching side of it. Uh, there's the interpersonal domain, which talks about uh, their relationships with, with students. Some folks are very, some folks are very, very strong in this. It does matter, you know. Um, uh, and, and some students re really need that. But sometimes there's, a, there's an awful lot of transfer. Students will have a whole new respect for the, for the discipline because they have a great respect for the instructor. Uh, and then there's the or, then there's the or, 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 or organization domain, and that again, how well you organize, how well you know, and how how comfortable you are with that. One thing I wanted to mention uh, before we go, uh, and that is, it's almost there's the, the three of them that add up to that, what used to be a mythical thing called, called teacher presence. We struggle with that notion as, as, a, as, a organ, as, you know, as an, as an in, 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 in industry, for, for lack of a better word, struggled with it for decades. You know, it was almost like a magical beast with a horn in the middle of its head. Um, but research has shown that it's pretty much a combination of those three things. The one they were missing was engagement. So we talk about teacher presence all coming from the teacher, but it's not. It's about the flow, the flow, the flow, the flow of information that creates that, that, that creates the presence. One last thing I'll talk about because they mentioned it a lot this morning, uh, and when when they were talking about uh, this whole notion. <coughs> Of, trans, of trans, transformative learning. And it's to talk about going to a specific thing, transforming into a nurse, transforming into an in, in, in engineer. Sometimes the transformation is just, just personal, as we, we, as, we, as, we, as we talked about it. It's about students, and, and Danny mentioned about students are there to just get over hurdles. Well, sometimes getting over hurdle can be a transformational experience, mm -hmm. simply because, hey, I did that. Right, you know, I was able, I was able to do that. And one of the one of the big things when you talk to employers or anybody who deals with university graduates at, afterwards, I mean, why do you go looking for a university graduate? They say, well, they don't know anything about X, you know, like they don't know anything about publishing, they don't know anything about whatever. But they've done that, they've gotten over that. Right? So we're going to bring them in and we're going to teach them this stuff. We know they learn well because they've done, you know, they've, they've got this degree and they've done do that. And we know well, they, and we need somebody in business, so we took somebody who had a degree in business, right? And so we taught them how to, we took up somebody who was a nurse, or took somebody for whatever. And so they know they lean a certain way in terms of their content ability and that kind of knowledge, but they also know they have the rigor to get through these particular, and the students know they do. Like they, they're stuff like, I got a degree. Yeah, <laughs> there's, a certain, there's a certain success to that. And that's transformative as well. That means you go on, you've had success, and we often talk about that with, with, with the teachers when they're going to the students and say, you know, don't be afraid to make that first assessment just a little easier. Let them succeed. Right? Give them that chance to succeed. I said, you, you can make them harder as you go by. But at least when they've succeeded first, you know, they got a better shot. At least they have that notion. They're in that success mode. Right? And they're going to want to keep on with that, 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 that success mode. Anyways, there was our activity. Yeah, <laughs> but we won't have time. <laughs> yeah. Does anybody have any questions about... Uh